Hello, and welcome to the second part of Matthias's Rust Corner. Are you confused about functions and looking for some pointers? Are you tired of endlessly discussing application structure and looking for some closure? Look no further! Today, we're diving into function pointers and closures. We will go through how closures capture their environment and how they differ from regular function pointers. The newly stabilized async closures we'll get to mention. And finally, we discuss dynamic versus size closures and how this affects your application. Before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that I created a GitHub repository to go along with this video series. It contains examples relevant to all the published videos that you can play around with and modify to explore further. The link is in the description below. Let's start with the basics. In Rust, we have two primary ways of declaring functions. We can either use named functions, like the one on the left side of the screen, or anonymous functions, which we see on the right. Named functions are what you would expect them to be. They are declared with the normal fn identifier parameter list function body signature, and they can have a return type. Anonymous functions, usually referred to as closures, are defined using the lambda expression. It uses the double pipe symbols surrounding the argument list, followed by an optional return type and the function body. You typically assign closures to variables, which you then pass around as function pointers. A function pointer is exactly what it sounds like. It's a pointer to the place in program memory where the function implementation lies. To run the function, the application simply makes a normal function call to that location and executes it. It's worth noting at this point that a function called from a function pointer can only access data that is either global or passed to it as an argument and put on its stack. Later in this video, we will talk about closures, which are allowed to carry data with them. We describe a function that consumes and or returns other functions as a higher order function. The reason for making higher order functions are numerous, but there are a few typical use cases for where they are needed. Callbacks when writing asynchronous code, such as event handlers or UI programming, and in functional programming, you need higher order functions to do things such as monadic composition. Here, we see the usage of our higher order function, use some fn. Notice that it accepts both a global named function and an inline lambda function. As expected, running this program invokes both functions and prints the correct messages. We can also access global variables from within our functions. In this case, we're using the std sync lazy lock wrapper to make a global mutex for our function call count. Function pointers can be useful, but we often wish to access non-global state from our lambda functions. But see what happens when we try to use name from the local scope when declaring our lambda function here. The compiler complains that it expected a function pointer, but found a closure. As I mentioned earlier, Closures are functions that capture and carry some data from their environment in which they are declared. They are always declared as anonymous functions, and as we mentioned briefly earlier, it is impossible to write their concrete type. Instead, we need to express the types of closures in terms of traits. The core library provides three different traits describing functions, fn, fnmut, and fn1s. We can use these to accept closures and function pointers instead of the concrete types we used earlier. Here are examples of using fn and fnmut traits to accept function pointers to call. Lastly, there is the fn1 trait. As the name suggests, you are allowed to call this function exactly once. Attempting to call it again will result in a compilation error, as is shown on the screen now. How neat is that? Let's revisit the example from before, which didn't compile by using a function pointer. When using a closure, we are now allowed to borrow the name into our anonymous function and use it to print a customized message. What's more, we can even capture mutable data using the fnmut closure. As you can see, our closures is allowed to borrow the mutable times called variable and increment it per invocation. However, if we try to capture a mutable value using the fn trait, as opposed to the fnmut trait, we get this error message. By default, closures capture data by reference. In many cases, this is fine, but there are cases where we need to share closures that must outlive the local scope, 
As we see here, we need to provide a closure that is valid for at least the static lifetime. If we simply capture by reference as we did before, the compiler kindly tells us that name does not live long enough for this closure. By adding the move keyword to our lambda definition, we instruct the compiler to move the ownership of the captured data into the closure itself. This is now legal, since we are no longer capturing any reference that conflicts with the static requirement. Notice that we are still allowed to capture the static message reference. It is time to dig a bit deeper into how closures are implemented under the hood. As we have seen, fn, fnmut, and fn1s are traits. This means our impl fn type can accept any type for which the fn trait is implemented. Since our closure needs to hold data, the compiler actually creates an anonymous struct, much the same way that lambda syntax creates an anonymous function. If we were to type it out, this is what it would look like in our previous capture example. This struct captures a reference to the variable on our stack, allowing its invocation to access data from the closure's environment. Notice that the struct creates a named lifetime tick A for the reference, connecting our closures to our stack's lifetime. Finally, we also need an implementation of the appropriate fn traits for our anonymous closure struct. Note that currently manually implementing fn traits this way is unstable and requires the nightly toolchain. I've provided an example of this in the associated GitHub repository. As we can see, the fn trait implementations are fairly simple. You need to provide a return type in the fn1's implementation, as well as the correct invocation method. This is where things get interesting. Notice how the fn1's call once function consumes the self argument by value. This means it's impossible for any piece of code to call this closure more than once. Along the same lines, the call mut method requires a mut self reference, forcing whoever invokes the closure to have an exclusive reference to it. It is fascinating how very powerful ideas and concepts can be expressed simply using the normal Rust type system. Just imagine making a type safe guarantee that a function can only be called once in any other language. As I am writing this manuscript, async closures were just stabilized, but are not yet released. If you're watching this sometime after the spring of 2025, you should have full support for the following examples in your Rust compiler. That is, given that the world doesn't blow up. For async closures, we have a new triplet of traits. To no surprise to anybody, they are async fn, async fn mut, and async fn once. As you see in this example, making an async closure is very similar to making a sync one. The only real difference is syntactically that we put the async keyword in front of the lambda definition. It also, of course, works with the move keyword as well. It is important to understand that both the async closures and also the futures that they produce borrow the captured variables. In these two examples, we try to move out to the name variable while it is still borrowed by the previous future, causing compilation errors. Let's finally compare the new async closures to the old way of doing similar things. Traditionally, we have made closures returning async blocks, as you can see on the screen now. This works, but there is a major limitation to this pattern. You are not allowed to return futures borrowing from the environment. If you want to read more about async closures, I've posted a link to the stabilization RFC in the description below. Finally, let's take a quick look at the options available to us for accepting and returning closures in our APIs. Up to this point, we have been using the argument position impl trait syntax for the examples. Uh, this is a shorthand for a generic argument to the function as seen on the screen. This is fine for standalone functions, but sometimes we wish to keep closures around in the struct for deferred invocation. To do this, we can either make the struct generic over the closure type, as seen on the left. And the other option is to store our closures as trait objects on the heap by using the din keyword as seen on the right. This is a trade-off choice. On the generic side, you have the inconvenience of adding a generic struct to your application, which has a tendency to infect the rest of the application structure by virtue of having to pass generic types around everywhere. But you allow the user to provide on-stack sized closures
which is optimal for performance. On the other hand, by using the trait object approach, you are guaranteeing a dynamic dispatch and heap access, which induces an overhead. This is usually not a performance problem for the vast majority of applications, but if you're doing really high performance code, this might be an issue. The dynamic approach is easier to use though, and in most use cases, more than performant enough. Or that even though the generic closure type is sized, this doesn't mean that the closure itself is sized. This is because the FN traits are implemented for both boxdunfn and refdunfn. What this means is it's always up to the caller of an API to ensure that the closure is on the stack if this is necessary for your application. Sometimes you will need to clone a closure into multiple event handlers. An example of this is if your input component in a UI application will use the same callback for both the submit signal and on the keystroke of enter. It is tempting to put the clone bound on the closure type and simply clone the closure. But be aware that this can have some nasty unintended side consequences. Remember how closures are just anonymous structs? Well, by cloning them, you are also cloning whatever it is that they capture, which in some cases could be quite a bit of data. To ensure you avoid unnecessary cloning, it might be a good idea to wrap your closures in a reference counted pointer and clone that instead. If you need to use an fn mut, you can use a locking primitive in addition to the pointer. That's all about function pointers and closures for now. Subscribe and like the video if you want to see more Rust content. If you have a topic you wish to learn more about, leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.